Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Peek. I'm the Director of the International and Comparative Law Program here at UCLA School of Law. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today for this conference on contemporary issues in human rights presented by the International and Comparative Law Program. We have a wonderful program available for you today which will touch on a variety of human rights challenges. I want to thank our partners in this event, the Berkel Center for International Relations, the Global Human Rights Initiative, the Health and Human Rights Law Project at UCLA School of Law, the UCLA International Institute, the Center for Near Eastern Studies, the UCLA Center for World Health, and the Richard Havasian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History. I also want to say a very special thank you to Sherry Yuan, who is one of our faculty support group here, for all her logistical heavy lifting this week and in the months leading up to the conference. I also wanted to draw your attention to a wonderful photographic exhibit that we have in the hallway. Um, if you go out of the door here and turn left, all down the hallway we have uh, some photographs in an exhibit called Suspended Lives, Young Syrian Refugees in the Netherlands, and the photographer is Maureen Drennan. Finally, I would like to welcome our Dean, uh, Jennifer Manukin, and thank her for the fantastic support of international law and human rights at the law school. Dean Manukin is the David G. Price and Dallas P. Price Professor of Law and became Dean of the Law School in August of 2015. She previously served as Vice Dean for Faculty and Research and Vice Dean for Faculty Recruitment and Intellectual Life. Dean Manukin is a leading evidence scholar and is the founder and faculty co-director of Pulse at UCLA Law, which is the program on understanding law, science, and evidence. She is also co-author of two major evidence treaties, a member of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Science, Technology, and Law, and serves on the Electronic Privacy Information Center Advisory Board. She was elected to the American Law Institute in 2011. Please join me in welcoming Dean Manukin. Thank you so much, Jess, and thank you, everybody, uh, for being here today for what I know is going to be an exceptional conference and I think uh, a terrific day of both collaboration and insight. Uh, as Jessica said, I'm Jennifer Manukin, and I um, have the great honor of being dean here at the UCLA Law School. Um, and I'm really, I'm so pleased that we have the opportunity to have this set of conversations today with such uh, a terrific set of panelists and, um, and a, I hope, engaged audience as well. As anybody who has even a passing familiarity with the daily headlines know, knows already, the challenges in human rights today are many and often dire. Armed conflict, civil rights abuses, environmental challenges, and genocide have prompted millions to have to migrate from their homelands at great risk to their lives and health. Millions of others are dealing with the aftermath of atrocities and seeking redress and recognition in international tribunals. Today's conference with panels on, on health and conflict zones, on genocide and mass atrocities, and on the impact of surveillance and cyber warfare on civil liberties, among other topics, aims to shed light on these phenomena and to identify paths toward progress, daunting as that task may be. My job right now is really just to welcome you and to make a few brief thank yous. Um, First of all, I very much do want to thank the indefatigable Jessica Peake, who just uh, gave us our first welcome. She's the director of the International and Comparative Law Program at UCLA, and she has been one of the driving forces behind this conference. So let's give her a hand of applause. Jess has had a busy and productive 2017. She served as a judge at a moot court competition in Afghanistan. She's led our UCLA students at the Clara Barton competition in Washington, DC. And she's done a good deal to put on today's excellent program. I also very much want to thank Sherry Yuan, who's one of our faculty support assistants here at the law school, who's done a tremendous amount for the logistics of today and very much deserves our thanks for the fact that there, we will have everything from good food uh, to microphones and um, that the AV will hopefully work. And so I want to absolutely thank Sherry. Thank you, Sherry, for all of you done. And I very much want to thank Professor Azlabali, a member of our law school faculty, 
and the current director of UCLA's Center for Near Eastern Studies for her tremendous guidance with every aspect of this conference as well. And I will also mention that Asla's new book, an edited volume that offers a comparative study of constitution, religion, and democracy in 14 nations, just came out a few weeks ago. So thank you and congratulations to Asla. As Jess already mentioned, several organizations are our partners in hosting today's event. A variety of centers on human rights and international law that are doing tremendously important work here at the university and beyond. Their names are also listed in your program, and I'm very grateful for their partnership and their involvement. Here at UCLA Law School, I'm also very proud that we have a terrific group of faculty in international and comparative law, nearly all of whom are with us here today, and most of whom will be participating in some way in today's conference. I love that we get to join our, our, our internal strengths with strengths around the whole university and a truly remarkable set of leaders uh, from the front lines of human rights, law, and advocacy from around the globe. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm excited and grateful for the fruitful and fun of ex exchange of ideas that I know lies ahead for us. Um, I also look forward to speaking to you again, um, including at the afternoon reception in the Shapiro Courtyard, just a few steps away, where I'm very excited because we will make a big announcement about a new initiative in human rights education and advocacy here at UCLA. Um, now I'd like us to get started with the actual content of the day, and I'd like to welcome the panelists for the first panel um, to come join us. So let's please give a warm welcome to our first set of panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Gardbaum. I'm a professor of comparative constitutional law here at UCLA. Our first panel uh, addresses the key human rights issue of civil liberties in the age of terror. Since 9-11, there's been a massive increase of state surveillance and rapid development of ever more intrusive technologies which have combined to put the old tension between national security and civil liberties in a new context. But superimposed on this, has been the rise of state and non-state cyber attacks as a new form of security threat that may result in further erosion of civil liberties, both by those perpetrating them and by states attempting to counter them. These are the range of challenges that our distinguished panelists uh, will address, describe, and shed light on. And they are uh, Kristen Eikense, uh, who is an assistant professor of law here at the UCLA School of Law, uh, one of her primary research and teaching interests is in national security law, uh, including cyber security. Uh, David Kay, uh, next to Kristen, uh, is clinical professor of law at UC Irvine, uh, and he is also the UN Human Rights Council's special rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of ex expression uh, and speech. Uh, thirdly, uh, Jennifer Robinson, uh, is a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers, uh, the UK's leading human rights practice. Uh, she's also a former director of advocacy at the Bertha Foundation, a global program and network to support emerging lawyers uh, in public interest litigation. And she's appeared in leading freedom of expression cases in the UK Supreme Court, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, and around the world. Finally, uh, John Villasenor is a professor of electrical engineering, public policy and management at UCLA. Uh, he's a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a national fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, his work addresses the intersection of digital technology with public policy and the law. Um, how we'll proceed is that each of our four uh, distinguished panelists will speak for approximately 10 minutes, uh, and then we will open up the session uh, for question and answer um, using the standing mics. Uh, and I make a special plea uh, uh, to ask people uh, uh, to uh, ask succinct one succinct question uh, and not to um, uh, engage in uh, uh, long uh, uh, comments because we are very short on time. It would be great if we can get as many uh, questions as possible uh, for our distinguished panelists. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, begin by asking uh, Kristen uh, to start proceedings. Thank you. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today. And I want to thank uh, Jess Peake for organizing the conference, the International Comparative Law Program, 
my fellow faculty in the program, and also Dean Manukin for her support of the International Comparative Law Program. So I want to touch briefly in my remarks on three issues where both domestic and international law are struggling to keep up with new challenges posed by cybersecurity threats. These are three areas where there, there's an ongoing debate. And if the debate goes in one direction, it may be a privacy and human rights protective direction. If it, does, if it goes in the other direction, then there may be more severe privacy and human rights problems. So the three issues I'll touch on briefly are election interference, vulnerability disclosure, and law enforcement access to data stored in the cloud. So let me start with election interference. Election interference has been a concern for cybersecurity experts for some time, mostly because they thought that actual election vote machines would be hacked. Obviously, election interference manifested in a somewhat different way in the 2016 presidential election. So this started back last June when a cybersecurity firm called CrowdStrike alleged that Russia, the government of Russia, was responsible for hacking the Democratic National Committee. The Obama administration followed this up in October with an official accusation against Russia. Of course, the election occurred in November. And then finally, at the end of December, the Obama administration reacted and retaliated against Russia. In doing so, the Obama administration issued sanctions against Russian government officials and also expelled Russian diplomats from the country. But in doing this, they didn't say that Russia had actually violated international law. What President Obama said is that these were a necessary and appropriate response to Russia's efforts to harm U.S. interests in violation of established international norms of behavior. So why not call Russia out for violating international law? It's actually a complicated question, and it's not entirely clear that what, Ru what Russia did did violate international law. So the two most on-point potential violations of international law would be a violation of sovereignty or a violation of the principle of non-intervention. There are a couple of problems with these, though. For the violation of sovereignty, what Russia did didn't actually cause physical damage within the United States. <laughs> Nothing was destroyed. Not even, unlike in the Sony hack, for example, was data destroyed. Computers didn't have to be replaced. This was simply an instance of disclosure, uh, theft of information, and then disclosure in a sort of calculated fashion. We've never had a violation of sovereignty like that before. So how about non-intervention? One of the key features of the international law principle of non-intervention is the idea of coercion. And prototypically, this has been military intervention. A state is coerced when it has, there's military intervention by another state. Again, what Russia did doesn't line up neatly with the prototypical examples of non-intervention. So we find ourselves in a situation where there's a, by many people, uh, think that, they're, that what Russia did should be regarded as illegal. But existing international law doesn't really map on very well. So that leaves us in a situation where we either need to stretch existing legal categories to capture what Russia did, or to create new legal prohibitions. Now, how does this fit in with human rights? I mean, we think about election interference as sort of a state-level issue. But the, as a matter of international human rights law, individuals have a right to participate in the political process, rights to vote, rights to participate in democratic um, elections. So to the extent that you have a foreign government that is interfering at a state level with that right, this does become a human rights issue. OK, so let me talk about the second issue. And this is vulnerability disclosure. So this received a lot of publicity last year in conjunction with the Apple FBI dispute over the FBI's access to the iPhone of one of the San Bernardino shooters. The US government obtained a court order that purported to force Apple to basically write new code that would allow the government to access the iPhone. It would bypass the, you know, if you enter the wrong passcode a number of times on an iPhone, it wipes all the data off the iPhone. It would have been code that would have allowed the government to circumvent that restriction. Apple pushed back and argued that the government's demand would actually weaken security for all iPhone users. The dispute ended, though, when the FBI purchased a tool, purchased a way to access the iPhone on a shadowy black market. Reportedly, the FBI paid about $1.3 million for the tool to access the iPhone. Now, this is a phenomenon that's called lawful hacking. This is an instance where law enforcement uses a vulnerability that it either develops or purchases to access uh, either iPhones or other means of communication for purposes of intelligence collection or law enforcement. So law enforcement agencies aren't the only agencies doing this. In the last year, we've had actually several major leaks of hacking tools by the, uh, that used by the Central Intelligence Agency and by the National Security Agency. The most recent one was last Friday, if anyone's been following the news. So the fundamental tension here is really a security-security trade-off. So the government says it needs to withhold 
knowledge from companies that could patch the vulnerabilities, it needs to withhold the vulnerabilities from the companies in order to protect national security. So the government can go out and offensively use the vulnerabilities for either intelligence collection or for investigating crimes. On the other hand, the companies think of this, and individuals um, in, the, in the press, you'll see this argument made, think that this is just a way to weaken individual security, because the government is responsible for leaving some of these vulnerabilities unpatched. Now, this decision by the government to disclose or to withhold knowledge of the vulnerabilities was governed under the Obama administration by something called the Vulnerability Equities Process. So this was basically a process where multiple government agencies would get together and they would discuss whether or not to tell companies about a problem with their software so that the company could patch it. So the government would consider things like how likely is it that others will discover the vulnerability and begin exploiting it? How important is the intelligence that the U.S. government is trying to get using the vulnerability, et cetera? The outcomes of this process have major implications for the security of personal communications. To the extent that these vulnerabilities are disclosed and patched, that secures individuals' communications and protects their right to privacy. To the extent that they're withheld, it puts individual security at risk. The status of the vulnerability equities process in the Trump administration is entirely unclear. So this was an informal process in the Obama administration. It wasn't formalized in an executive order or in legislation. So we don't know what the Trump administration is doing. They may have maintained the process or they may have entirely abandoned it. Also, the process itself is, in many ways, very flawed. We don't know how many vulnerabilities are considered in the process. We don't know how many are disclosed coming out of the process. And we don't have very little information about how the government weighs whether to withhold or disclose. Just to return to the Apple iPhone case for a moment, that was a very high-profile instance where, the vulner where we knew that there was a vulnerability. The government publicly announced that they had it, that they had paid a million dollars for it. But the vulnerability there did not even enter the vulnerability equities process. So the government bought the vulnerability on this sort of shadowy market, and the FBI said that it purchased the access method, and I'm quoting here, but did not, however, purchase the rights to technical details about how the method functions or the nature and extent of any vulnerability upon which the method may rely in order to operate. So therefore, it didn't have enough information to send the vulnerability through the vulnerability equities process. So it didn't even consider whether or not to disclose it, because in negotiating the contract with the entity that sold the vulnerability to the government, the government didn't purchase the right rights. So there may be ways to fix this process going forward, and this is something the Trump administration would have to do. They could consider formalizing the process. They could consider being more transparent about the process. And they could consider sort of reshift or shifting the balance between withholding vulnerabilities and disclosing. And w which way they go on that will affect the extent to which the process and government withholding of vulnerabilities implicates human rights. So let me touch just briefly on the final point, and this is the question of law enforcement access to data stored in the cloud. So this became an important issue in what's become known as the Microsoft Ireland case. So in that case, the U.S. government issued a warrant to Microsoft pursuant to a statute called the Stored Communications Act. So the warrant ordered Microsoft to produce the contents of a web-based email account of one of its customers. Microsoft provided the non-content information from the email account, so sort of <laughs> metadata, essentially. But it refused to comply with respect to the contents of the emails, because the contents of the emails were stored in a server in Dublin, Ireland. So Microsoft acknowledged that it could access the contents of the emails from the United States. But it said that to do so, to comply with the warrant, would be an extraterritorial search or seizure, and that was impermissible. So the US government, on the other hand, said, well, if you can access it from the United States, this isn't extraterritorial. It's just a access within the United States, and that's good enough. The Second Circuit Court of Appeals sided with Microsoft and said that this would constitute an impermissible extraterritorial search or seizure. But that's not going to be the last word on the issue. So since the Second Circuit, the Second Circuit decided the case last summer, and then they denied en banc review at the end of January. Since then, several district courts have come out the other way, or mag magistrate judges and um, headed up to the district courts have come out the other way. And in cases with respect to Google and Yahoo, they've actually said that those companies have to comply. Even if the data is stored abroad, so long as they are in the United States and can access the information from the United States, they have to comply. This isn't just a question of US law and whether US courts will permit US companies acting pursuant to US legal process to produce this information. So there are actually other governments have begun making similar command, uh, 
similar demands for information around the world. So countries including the UK, Belgium, and also China. So the lack of agreement on how international jurisdictional principles limit or don't limit what information companies can access is creating the prospect of sort of massive governmental access to personal information. So if you think about the US government, the claims that the US government is making that as so long as a provider can access information within the, from the United States, so Google or Microsoft, the US government can access the personal information, the contents of emails from any person around the world. And if you flip it around and think about it from the other direction, other governments are making similar claims about access to personal information of US citizens. So in all three of these areas, the unique features of, of cyberspace and of data and of cybersecurity <coughs> threats are putting pressure on existing law. And these are all three of them ongoing debates, and it's really not clear which way they're going to go. They could go in the privacy protective direction, where we consider election interference to be a violation of international law and it becomes limited where law enforcement access to data stored in the cloud is limited based on something other than just whether a company can access it. And it's not at all clear that that's the direction they'll go. So these are all ongoing debates that could have huge implications for sort of personal security and personal privacy going forward. Thanks very much, Kristen. David. Great. Thanks so much. It's great to see so many familiar faces here. And I especially want to thank Dean Manukin, Professor Bali, Jess Peek for, for including me in this um, really interesting and obviously very timely um, set of discussions over the course of the day. I, I actually want to start, um, I think there'll be some commonalities with Kristen's presentation, particularly around issues of jurisdiction, uh, but I want to start with uh, a story, uh, and it's a story that uh, involves uh, Ethiopia. So eventually, after I tell this uh, fairly, hopefully, short story, uh, I'll identify some common themes that I think really reflect some serious issues around uh, the repression of freedom of expression, uh, privacy, uh, the right to protest, uh, and other fundamental freedoms that are really prevalent in the, in the digital age. So um, first I'm going to start with a John Doe. Uh, his name is uh, Mr. Kidane. Uh, it's a pseudonym used by a plaintiff represented by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, uh, in a case now in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. So Kidane was born and raised in Ethiopia. He was granted asylum in the United States in the 1990s. Since then, he became a US citizen. And during this time, he's often provided technical support uh, to members of the Ethiopian diaspora community, including to a democratic protest movement known as uh, Jinbot 7, though he himself is not a member of that movement. He's always used the pseudonym of Kidane uh, because of his fear of putting his family at risk in Ethiopia, in Ethiopia where most of his family continues to reside. <coughs> so in late 2012 or early 2013, agents of the government of Ethiopia through a phishing email of the sort that uh, John Podesta inadvertently made infamous, uh, infected Kidane's computer with malware which installed a surveillance program known as FinSpy, produced by a British company called FinFisher. Over the course of about six months, FinSpy recorded Kidane's activity, including <laughs> Skype calls, even his, uh, his ninth grade son's science project, uh, and transmitted that information back to Ethiopia. I'm curious what they did with the science project, but, um, but it, we know that because of the work of a group called Citizen Lab. So Citizen Lab is an organization based uh, at the University of Toronto. It's a research and advocacy institute. And it did the, the forensic work that discovered this surveillance. They've also shown how FinSpy, again, the, um, the malware that was used in this particular case dealing with Kidane, FinSpy has been used by government purchasers to surveil and undermine dissenters in a wide range of countries, including Egypt, Bahrain, Turkmenistan, Pakistan, and at least a half dozen other countries. So EFF, uh, on Kidane's behalf, brought a Wiretap Act claim against the government of Ethiopia under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act uh, in US court. Ethiopia, however, has prevailed at the district and appellate court levels. The DC Circuit panel found against Kidane on the basis of the entire tort doctrine, namely that for a claim under the FSIA to proceed, 
that is, for the claim against a government under the FSIA to proceed, the entire tort must have taken place in the United States. The courts have thus far found unpersuasive EFF's argument that the entire tort consisted of the malware infection of Kidani's computer, which was in Maryland, where Kidani lives, and the regular surveillance over the course of the six months. Again, surveillance of Kidani while he was in Maryland. The court took the view that the tort, assuming the veracity of the complaint, involved actions of the Ethiopian government in Addis Ababa. EFF just last week saw an en banc hearing of the D.C. Circuit's dismissal of the complaint, so we'll see where it heads. But what I wanted to do, based on this set of facts, is identify six issues and questions that I think it raises that go well beyond the situation in Ethiopia, and I think raise some issues that hopefully over the course of the day, and maybe even later on the panel, we'll talk a little bit about. So the first issue is government repression through digital surveillance. I think it's trite, but it's true that the digital age offers governments like Ethiopia, which years ago would not have had the capacity to conduct this kind of surveillance, it offers them opportunities of repression that go well beyond what they would have previously been capable of. I think it's important to make a point about law, and this is UCLA School of Law, so I should make a legal point. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights clearly provide everyone with the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers and through any media. It provides a right to privacy, that is, the right not to have your privacy interfered with, right to peaceful assembly and protest, and the ICCPR also offers other kinds of protection, such as the right to participate in public affairs. These are all guaranteed under the covenant. Now here is an activist who is clearly being interfered with. His right to privacy, his right to seek information in a way that isn't restricted, is being interfered with in this case, but what we see is increasing surveillance, not only of activists in countries like Ethiopia and elsewhere, which I'll get to in a moment, but also repression of journalists, of opposition figures, of artists, of academics, and many others. So that's the first point. Government repression through digital surveillance is very clearly shown in the case of Kidane. A second point is the expansive nature of national security claims today. So this gets to Ethiopia's abuse of digital space, in this case and more generally. So a country like Ethiopia and many other countries, I think this is an epidemic in some respects, will say, yes, we agree that everyone has the right to freedom of expression. Very few countries actually deny that that's a human right. But what they'll look at is the third paragraph of Article 19, which provides for the legality of restrictions on expression. And it's a similar kind of set of restrictions that you see in other provisions of human rights law. And it requires three parts, essentially. One is that the restriction is provided by law, which means it should have been adopted by regular process. It can't be secret law. It should also be law that is relatively precise, so it provides individuals with some guidance as to what's lawful and what's unlawful. And then it also requires that any restriction be necessary and proportionate in order to protect a particular legitimate objective. And those legitimate objectives are spelled out. Those include the rights or reputations of others, national security and public order, and public health and public morals. The problem is that national security and public order have become essentially a label to legitimize any kind of restriction. And you see that in the case of Ethiopia, whether it's in the case of surveilling individual activists or it's surveilling journalists. And I'll get to, I'll mention that, the specific surveillance of journalists in a moment. Third point is jurisdiction. Maybe this is a little bit where Kristen and my presentation overlap a little bit in the sense of jurisdiction. So cross-border surveillance 
just as, um, as we see in cross-border access to data that might be in the cloud, for example, uh, is becoming a regular feature of international life. And yet the legal and practical constraints on such surveillance, at least as a matter of international law, are extremely limited. So from the US perspective, there are issues around extraterritoriality, right? So the United States has long complained or argued that uh, human rights law, generally speaking, does not extend beyond, uh, beyond our borders. In other words, it doesn't constrain the United States when it's acting overseas. So for example, much of the discussion around Edward Snowden's revelations focused on uh, restrictions and surveillance on individuals in the United States. But outside the United States, one of the major uh, controversies was around US surveillance of foreign nationals right, in their countries, which really barely resonated uh, in the US media um, you know, over the last three years since those revelations. Um, but interestingly, Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as I mentioned, it protects everyone's right to freedom of expression regardless of frontiers. So unlike other provisions of human rights law, it actually has a built-in mechanism for considering trans-border kinds of issues. The fact of the matter is, though, today, and you see this in the Kidane case, is that when an individual wants to constrain a country from conducting the surveillance, this trans-border surveillance, certainly has very limited ability to do that in US courts, and that limited ability extends really globally. So it's, it's a significant gap in our ability to deal with uh, cross-border surveillance. Fourth issue is digital security tools. So this was a situation where Kidane, who actually was a tech-oriented uh, guy, um, had ways to protect himself, protect himself. So one way that he could protect himself was using a pseudonym. Of course, a pseudonym itself doesn't get you very far. Oftentimes, you need tools of anonymity that are uh, stricter, that allow you to seek and receive information online that won't uh, put you on the radar of the government for example. Um, similar, similarly with cases uh, related to, um, uh, to encryption. But unfortunately, in cases like Ethiopia, and this came up in several cases related to journalists in Ethiopia, um, the government actually restricts the ability to use these security tools. So not only is the law far behind when it comes to the international restraint on surveillance, but domestically it's becoming more and more difficult to protect oneself against, um, against such surveillance. So I have less than a minute, so I'll say two things really quickly. Of course, these were the most important points I was gonna make. Um, the fifth point is private surveillance companies, right? So I described how, this, uh, how Ethiopia got hold of this uh, malware. Um, it purchased it from a British company, which I think has been sold um, since. Um, but this, again, is a problem of international law in the sense that private companies that are making available to countries that don't otherwise have the ability to conduct this kind of surveillance, it's making that capacity available to them. And private, private actors have very limited ability uh, to, um, uh, well, they have ability to, to sell that. Com countries have very limited ability to constrain that. The last role, maybe this is something we can talk about later during Q&A, is the role of democratic countries. Right? So democratic countries are doing very little about constraining private actors who are selling this technology. And at the same time, they're modeling exactly the kind of behavior, maybe to a certain different extent, but modeling the behavior that repressive countries are using uh, increasingly around the world. So with that, I'll stop. Which I'm over to Jen. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Jennifer. <coughs> Uh, good morning. I also want to add my thanks to the organisers of the conference today. Um, I'm going to be speaking and focusing my remarks on national security and free speech. David's touched upon it in the context of WikiLeaks and the US grand jury investigation into WikiLeaks. I've been on a member of the legal team for Julian Assange and WikiLeaks since 2010, since just prior to the Iraq war logs, the diplomatic cables and uh, subsequent publications. I think it's important to talk about free speech and the right to publish in the context of national security because these publications have been so important in terms of understanding what the national security state is doing and how the national security state is interfering with our civil liberties, our right to free speech, our right to privacy. 
WikiLeaks has, I think as a result of WikiLeaks, we now start to talk about uh, the right to know, um, that in our democracy we can't make informed democratic choices. Is this better? In our democracies, we can't make informed democratic choices without understanding what it is our government is doing. And as a result of the publications of WikiLeaks, um, we look back on the diplomatic cables, on the spy files, which showed us more about what the companies, Dave has just mentioned, the technologies that are being sold to uh, undemocratic regimes around the world interfering with our rights. Um, these are incredibly important publications. The revelations of Edward Snowden, who was inspired by WikiLeaks and by Chelsea Manning to do what he did, which demonstrated unconstitutional spying in this country on US citizens by your government. These are incredibly important revelations and the free speech protections that your constitution enshrines in the First Amendment for not just journalists but publishers and for the general public to publish as recognised in the Pentagon Papers uh, uh, case are incredibly important. Now since 2010, WikiLeaks has been subjected to a criminal investigation in this country, a grand jury investigation which is, has been described in Australian diplomatic cables as of unprecedented size and scale. It has been ongoing since that time. We know it's ongoing from court documents released and decisions of judges as, early as, uh, May la as late as May last year, refusing to release material of, uh, under freedom of information laws on the grounds that this criminal investigation into WikiLeaks is ongoing. Now, that criminal investigation was instituted under the Obama administration. We have long been saying that the precedent that is set by a criminal investigation into a public interest publisher sets a dangerous precedent for the First Amendment in the United States. What WikiLeaks does in terms of the act of receiving information from sources, maintaining the an anonymity of those sources and publishing that information in the public interest is exactly the same act that is engaged in by mainstream media organisations, the New York Times, the Washington Post. And a criminal investigation into WikiLeaks sets a chill on national security reporting. Now, I wasn't intending to do this today, but uh, we've all been wondering what your new administration would do with respect to WikiLeaks. Uh, you have, we have a president, President Trump, who once tweeted, I love WikiLeaks, um, but at the same time has called the US media the enemy of the people. Now, your CIA director gave his first speech last Thursday, and I am going to cede part of my presentation so that you can hear directly from him, um, and I'll speak to that after we've heard from, from Mike Pompeo. Now, for those of you who read the editorial page of the Washington Post, and I have a feeling many of you do, yesterday you would have seen a piece of sophistry penned by Mr. Assange. You would have read a convoluted mass of words where Assange compares himself to Thomas Jefferson, Dwight Eisenhower, and the Pulitzer Prize winning work of legitimate new news organizations such as the New York Times and the Washington Post. Assange claims to harbor an overwhelming admiration for both America and the idea of America. But I assure you this man knows nothing of America and our ideals. He knows nothing of our third president, whose clarion calls for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness continue to inspire us in the world. And he knows nothing of our 34th president, a hero, from my very own Kansas, who helped liberate Europe from fascists and guided America through the early years of the Cold War. No, I'm quite confident that had Assange been around in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, he would have found himself on the wrong side of history. We know this because Assange and his ilk make common cause with dictators today. Yes, they try unsuccessfully to cloak themselves and their actions in the language of liberty, language of liberty and privacy, but in reality, they champion nothing but their own celebrity. Their currency is clickbait, their moral compass non existent, their mission, personal self aggrandizement the destruction of Western values. When Snowden has gone to the comfortable clutches of Russian intelligence, his treachery directly harmed a wide range of US intelligence and military operations. Despite what he claims, he was no whistleblower. True whistleblowers use well-established and discreet processes in place, in, the, in place to voice grievances. They do not put American lives at risk. In fact, a colleague of ours at the National uh, Security Agency recently explained that more than a thousand foreign targets, people, groups, and organizations, more than a thousand of them tried to change how they communicated as a direct result of Snowden's disclosures. It's a staggering number. 
Bottom line is that it became harder for U.S. intelligence to keep Americans safe. It became harder to monitor communications of terrorist organizations that are bent on bringing bloodshed to our shores. Snowden's disclosures helped these groups find ways to hide themselves in crowded digital forests. And even in those cases, where we're able to regain our ability to collect, the damage has already been done. We work in a business with budgetary time constraints. The effort to get back access we previously possessed meant that we had less time to look at new threats. And as for Assange, his actions have attracted a devoted following among some of our most determined enemies. Following a recent WikiLeaks disclosure, an Al-Qaeda and Al in the Arabian Peninsula member posted a comment online thanking WikiLeaks for providing a means to fight America in a way that AQAP had not previously envisioned. AQAP represents one of the most serious threats to our country and around the world today. The group that is devoted not only to bringing down civil passenger planes, but our way of life as well. That Assange is the darling of these terrorists is nothing short of reprehensible. Have no doubt that the disclosures in recent years caused harm, great harm, to our nation's national security, and they will continue to do so for the long term. They also threaten the trust we've developed with our foreign partners when that trust is crucial currency among allies. They risk damaging morale for the good officers at the intelligence community and who take the high road every day. And I can't stress enough how these disclosures have severely hindered our ability to keep you all safe. No, Julian Assange and his kind are not the slightest bit interested in improving civil liberties or enhancing personal freedom. They have pretended America's First Amendment freedom shields them from justice. They may have believed that, but they are wrong. Assange is a narcissist who has created nothing of value. He relies on the dirty work of others to make himself famous. He's a fraud, a coward hiding behind a screen. And in Kansas, we know something about wizards hiding behind screens. But I'm not the only one who knows who Julian Assange really is. Even those who often benefit from Assange's leaks have called him out for his overblown statements. The Intercept, which has in the past gleefully reported unauthorized disclosures, accused WikiLeaks in late March of, quote, stretching the facts in his comments about the CIA. In the same article, the Intercept added that the documents, quote, were not worth the concern WikiLeaks generated by its public comments. So we all face a crucial question. What can we do about this? What can and should the CIA, the broader intelligence community, and the United States and our allies do about this unprecedented challenge posed by these hostile non-state intelligence agencies? There's no quick fix, nothing foolproof, no instant cure, but there are steps we can take to undercut the danger. First, the days like today, where we call out those who grant a platform to these leakers and so-called transparency activists. We know the danger that Assange and his not so merry band of brothers pose to democracies around the world. Ignorance or misplaced idealism is no longer an acceptable excuse for lionizing these demons. We are constantly reviewing insider threat work uh, and leakers. Uh, if there's one thing that uh, doesn't evolve, it's a So what you saw just there was the director of the CIA uh, improperly seeking to define what is and is not a legitimate media organisation and using a new semantics that we have not yet heard, calling a publisher a hostile non-state intelligence agency. Uh, he lacks irony when he suggests that WikiLeaks should focus fire on autocratic regimes while simultaneously calling for the restrictions of constitutional free speech protections in this country. WikiLeaks has, of course, published... Um, more than 57,000 documents on Erdogan in Turkey. WikiLeaks has published two and a half, nearly two and a half million documents on Assad in Syria, and 120,000 documents on the Saudi, Arabian, uh, Saudi Arabian regime. So to suggest that WikiLeaks somehow doesn't publish on autocratic regimes is simply false. But I think this is something that we ought to, um, this is an incredibly serious attack on public, public interest journalism and is an indication of what is to come it is reminiscent of the kinds of semantics that the United States government used with respect to Guantanamo, starting to use new forms of, of language around unlawful enemy, enemy combatants to then justify what was previously unthinkable legal action. Um, we need to think about what this means, a hostile intelligence agency. WikiLeaks collects information and publishes information which is critical of government. Does that categorization now then slip into applying to organizations like Human Rights Watch or ProPublica 
or any other media organisation that, that collects information and publishes it in the public interest that is critical of the national security acts of your government. I think that we need to take this incredibly seriously. From our point of view, uh, Julian Assange is in the Ecuadorian embassy because he has been granted asylum because of the risk of persecution should he be returned to the United States to face prosecution because of this criminal investigation. Uh, what we've just heard from the CIA director is an attempt to suggest that the First Amendment does not apply to cer certain categories of people, uh, that the US government will seek to extend criminal jurisdiction extraterritorially while not applying its own constitution. And in, the, in this eight day and age, uh, when national security reporting is more important than ever, I think we need to think about the chill that this kind of approach would place on national security reporting, not just for WikiLeaks and organisations like WikiLeaks, but for the US media here domestically within the United States. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. <coughs> John. Uh, thank you very much. I, I too will add my uh, appreciation to the, uh, the Dean uh, and to Professor Riley for organising this and bringing together um, such an interesting um, set of topics for free people to hear about today. I'll try to keep my remarks shorter, uh, uh, so as I know it's, I always find the most interesting part of these things, the questions and answers. I'll try not to, I want to make sure to leave some time for that. So I just want to give some technology perspective that might put things uh, in context that's pretty helpful. Um, so one of the things I did a couple of years ago is I looked at the cost of storage, um, which is fascinating. We, it, it is more than one million times less expensive today to store information than it was in the 1980s. One million times, not 10 times, not 100 times, one million. We're not one million times better at anything else I'm aware of. We're not a million times better at curing cancer or at educating our children, but we're a million times better at storing. And, and that, that fundamentally changes the nature of what can be stored. Um, when I did that study a few years ago, I did a calculation. I wanted to know how much would it cost to purchase the storage that could store everything an average person says in a telephone over the course of a full year. And the answer then was 17 cents. Uh, it's even cheaper now. And so what that means is that things that would have been completely unthinkable and impossible, you know, for example, to have a country literally record everything that its citizens say on a phone, uh, become not so hard and then trivial. And so then the question is what, and, and of course not all countries will do this, but there are, are clearly many around the globe who, when it becomes easy and trivial, will do it. And, and that raises some really fundamental and interesting, um, interesting questions. And if anyone wants to see all the data behind that, you can just do a search on a paper called Recording Everything, which I published through Rookings. It sort of explains where those numbers came from. So I think that technology um, is driving a lot of the, uh, Technology makes it easier, I guess I would say, in many ways to, to, um, for governments that wish to be oppressive, and there are certainly no shortage of them around the world, to, to do that uh, by getting access to more information in the past. I'll also emphasize another technological trend which was, which was related to one of the ones mentioned earlier, which was Kristen mentioned data in the cloud, and she mentioned this extraterritoriality issue, which is absolutely important. I, I fully agree with, with Kristen's assessment the, of, of the importance. I'll add to that by adding another complexity, which is the very recent, the cloud has been around and growing for, you can pick your number, but a decade or more is, is probably a reasonable, reasonable answer. Um, in, in addition to that, just in the last few years, you've seen the growth of, of uh, the proliferation of always on devices that have video and audio capability. And there's a fascinating case right now. It doesn't have any extraterritoriality uh, issues, but it's fascinating uh, nonetheless. Um, someone may, some of you may have heard of this a case involving the Amazon Echo, um, which is going on. There was a, a murder uh, that occurred, uh, and Amazon Echo was like a smart speaker, and you can sort of tell it to do things, and it'll you know play music of a certain kind or something like that. So there was a murder that occurred uh, here in the United States somewhere, and the house where the murder occurred had an Amazon Echo in it. And so investigators believe, or, or, or they think, perhaps, that the Amazon Echo may have heard things that happened at the moment of, of, the, of the crime. And so they have uh, issued a search warrant to Amazon uh, to see if in the cloud there is data stored uh, you know, a recording, essentially, you know, either in the moments before, during, or after when this crime occurred, and, and Amazon has, has resisted. Um, but that's, just, even in the domestic context, that's just a fascinatingly complex topic, and you can imagine, you know, 
all the more complex when you get to um, uh, when you get to the uh, you know, extra when you can do a kind of multinational, multi-jurisdictional case. I also want to add a, a, a kind of a wrinkle to the, and I maybe repronounce this wrong. Is it Kidane? Is it no. Kidane case that that was mentioned a, mom, a moment ago. Um, you know, this this entire tort uh, you know concept you know leads to some disturbing potential uh, outcomes. You know, as a as a thought experiment, imagine a driverless car or or just just an au highly automated car where it becomes possible to install malware to seize control of the car and then the person or the entity that did that is able to exert control and perhaps in a, in a nefarious way uh, to cause an accident you know, from outside the United States. I mean, clearly it would be ludicrous if the response of the system was to say, well, you know, they pushed the button in some other country and yes, yeah, someone died in the United States, but that's, you know, since they pushed the button somewhere else, the entire tort or whatever didn't happen here. So clearly there's got to be you know, I find it disturbing not only the facts that, that David Kay mentioned that there's this potential immunity uh, to installing malware from overseas, but but that's you know that's only one of many different things that you can imagine um, that could occur. And so clearly there's you know there's an interest here in the United States and a corresponding interest in other countries in being able to to uh, address uh, you know, wrongful acts that occur in the territory of that country, even when those wrongful acts are perpetrated. Uh, in part through uh, actions taken uh, outside, of the, outside of that country. Um, I also want to uh, mention the, uh, the, you know, Kristen mentioned the Apple case uh, and she gave a little bit of background. Um, I'll start by, I'll, the caveat I'll say is I was in many ways sympathetic to Apple's uh, position. Uh, I was particularly concerned with the order forcing or allegedly forcing Apple to write code and it seemed to me that among many other things there was a potential issue of compelled speech there in the sense that if you're actually forcing someone to create something you're not actually just forcing them to, to flick a switch or forcing them to open a door pursuant to a search warrant you're actually forcing them to write something that didn't exist before so I'm, so I'm sympathetic to that but at the same time I also found it you know I was also sympathetic to the opposite arguments on the other side which is that you know, Apple um, is a company with business interests, uh, and you know, should the decision for whether a company uh, you know, cooperates with the government or not be left solely to that company, uh, or should there be some at least uh, uh, you know aspirationally more objective framework for deciding that? And and you know, there's you can make the arguments on either side, and I'm sympathetic to both arguments. But but for one one framework that's relevant is CALEA. It's it's an acronym C A L E A. It's the Communications Assistant for Law Enforcement Act, which provides that. Um, that you know, phone companies, for example, when they're when they're ordered to install pursuant to a legal, uh, you know, for, to a warrant, or, ordered to wiretap a phone, they they have to co cooperate and they have to design their systems so they can actually actually do that. And I understand there are counter arguments as well. And Kalia is is clearly not applicable in, in the case uh, with Apple. But but again, there are legitimate uh, um, arguments on both sides. And then finally. Um, I wanted to, to briefly respond to, to some of the points, or one of the points that Jennifer made, and just throw out there for consideration that, that um, governments, including our government, does, do have uh, a legitimate purpose in keeping some information classified. Um, and, and so I, I would hate for that to be lost in discussion. There is, uh, and I am, I am probably as, as, as much of a First Amendment kind of, I have a very expansive view of the First Amendment, um, but that doesn't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a conflict to have a, an expansive view of the First Amendment while also believing that governments do have a legitimate reason uh, bounded by, you know, proper constraints and keeping some information classified. So, for example, uh, if there was information that, uh, if leaked, would nearly certainly result in the deaths of many American uh, citizens or troops, for example, uh, overseas, um, I am sympathetic to the to the desire to to not let that occur and to uh, try to make sure that those people are protected uh, to the maximum extent possible. So, uh, just wanted to inject that into the into the dialogue that there is there are those legitimate concerns. But I'm sure all of your questions will be far more interesting than anything else I could say. So I will yield the rest of my time. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks to each of you for very uh, interesting presentations. So we have about 25 minutes for question and answer, and we have um, standing mics. So I would like to ask people, and I particularly would like to encourage students uh, to come and ask questions. Um, but uh, please come to the standing mics. Um, we will take um, two questions from each side 
uh, and then uh, uh, the panelists will have the chance to uh, respond to those. And again, I, I would urge people uh, to ask one succinct question uh, rather than uh, engage in uh, long comments so that we can get more people uh, uh, asking questions. So, um, yes, please. This question is for David. A couple of weeks ago, you mentioned um, when you were a keynote speaker at the other school um, <laughs> that remains unknown, uh, that the U.S. was considering leaving the Human Rights Council. Is that, did I get that correct? And have they changed their mind since the Syria issue? So, so uh, I'll take, we're going to okay. take the, the Oh, take the, yeah. yes. okay. Please. My question is, uh, uh, ask the panel to address the issue of the book, five bookkeepers that were kidnapped from Hong Kong into China and paraded on television. One of the bookkeeper was kidnapped from Thailand, who is a Swedish citizen. The other was kidnapped from Hong Kong, who has a British passport. I'd like to find out what recourse do they have in terms of this kidnapping and in terms of their rights. Also, I'd like to find out what we can do as far as us uh, Chinese Americans can do because the foreign minister has claimed that any Chinese that were born in China are first and foremost a Chinese citizen, which means that if I went, go to Hong Kong, I myself could be considered a Chinese citizen, even though I am American citizen. Thank you. Hello, my question is for anyone who feels like answering it. Um, I'm wondering if any of you have suggestions as to how best safeguard electoral processes um, in the face of the proliferation of fake news, um, as well as automated voting, um, which may pose risks to our process. Um, that's all. Hi. Um, so you discussed a little bit about the concerns related to the different processes of surveillance, whether it's the authorization of surveillance, the um, actual ga collecting of information, the retention of that information, the dissemination of that information. Uh, and I was just wondering a little bit about what you found was most concerning with regards to those different processes and human rights, but also particularly to dissemination of information and how it relates to on a national level, for example, the Five Eyes Networks, and on a more domestic level, um, information sharing between domestic law enforcement agencies and uh, the, the government with regards to national security. Thank you. Great, so I'm going to invite the panel members to respond uh, uh, and again invite uh, anybody who wants to ask a question to come up to the mics. Should I start with the Human Rights Council? Actually, the Human Rights Council issue uh, and the issue in Hong Kong um, kind of go together to a certain extent. So um, we, we don't know if the U.S. is going to withdraw from the Human Rights Council. So the Human Rights Council is the central human rights body in the UN system, and the US uh, was elected to a seat on the council, uh, and um, you know, over the course of the Obama administration was quite active in, um, in sort of pursuing different human rights issues, of course also uh, defending some allies there as well, so it's a complicated place. Um, but, but I think that, I would think about the Human Rights Council in a more general, um, setting. In other words, um, so what's the direction of U.S. engagement with multilateral institutions and to what extent will the United States use the tools of international law in order to either advance human rights or even to protect its own interests? And so whatever happens in the Human Rights Council, I, mean, I think we can already see um, that the U.S. is taking, and it's not as if the U.S. has always been this, you know, even under the Obama administration, this multilateralist angel. Um, but it seems to be moving further and further away from multilateral institutions and multilateral goals. So we don't know what's gonna happen with the Human Rights Council. I mean, I would say though, and maybe this is connected to, to the situation for the, the booksellers, the publishers in Hong Kong, 
the Human Rights Council offers individuals like those booksellers a forum really to, I mean, it's a trite phrase, but to speak truth to power, right? To actually be in a room in Geneva where there are governments sitting, including the government of China, um, and to raise these kinds of issues directly um, among other governments and, and China. And so to the extent that the US moves away, it also reduces the, the effectiveness of an organization uh, like that. It, it allows others to also move away or to pursue agendas that might actually be inimical to, um, to human rights. So, you know, I would connect those two things together. I would also say, with respect to the situation for the booksellers uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong, I mean, what we've seen is Hong Kong moving uh, gradually, but over the last 18 months, kind of a quickening way of moving away from democratic norms. Um, the, you know, the, the PRC is not a party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but the ICCPR, by virtue of the agreement by which the UK left Hong Kong, the ICCPR, so human rights law, still applies in Hong Kong, uh, and yet we see in cases like the booksellers, um, which is really a case of private law, uh, uh, or secret law, being applied to individuals uh, and then when they're returned, there being no information about why they were detained and what their future is, um, that's a direct violation of human rights law that applies in Hong Kong. So individuals like that can be using tools like the Human Rights Council at least to raise those, those concerns. But unfortunately, they don't have much of a mechanism to raise those issues uh, with China directly. Take the the, elect, the election integrity issue. So, I, uh, the question raised the issue of both sort of election integrity and fake news, and those those issues are obviously related, but I think they're uh, somewhat distinct as well. So, on the electoral integrity issue, I mean, you can talk about some technological solutions. So, you've got the integrity of the actual voting processes, right? So the part of the concern in the United States is that there are a number of jurisdictions that in the wake of the hanging Chad controversy in the 2000 election thought, okay, no more punch cards, let's do electronic voting, right? So you've got touch screen voting. But in their rush to purchase uh, machines that wouldn't produce hanging chads, they purchased machines that don't produce a paper backup trail. So in the last couple of years, you've seen jurisdictions across the United States get smarter about that. And so jurisdictions have started to require paper audit trails. So you push a button on the screen, a you know, touch screen, and it prints out a physical copy of, of your results. Harder to tamper with that. Even if someone hacks and changes the, the screen itself, you still have the paper backup. We've also seen some interesting implications of this internationally. So the Netherlands held an election in March. And they actually were set up to do electronic counting of their votes, but because of fears about cybersecurity and hacking, they, they hand counted the ballots in that election. Uh, similarly, in France, France has an upcoming legislative election set for June, and they were going to allow electronic voting for overseas voters. They've suspended that. So in some circumstances, the, the sort of solution to the technological problem may be actually going sort of more low tech and going to these older you know, paper ballots. They've got their problems too, but at least it's harder to hack a paper ballot. The fake news problem uh, is a really hard problem to solve. I mean, one thing we've seen recently, if anyone's logged into Facebook, Facebook is putting this banner at the top of the account saying, you know, we are, we're, we're acting about fake news. You might notice different stories on Facebook are tagged as sort of suspicious. So um, <laughs> stories that have been flagged as being not factually accurate. Um, are, are actually being flagged on Facebook and other social media platforms. So the, the question of whose responsibility is it to deal with, with fake news is a really tough problem, but you are seeing at least the social media companies sort of take this on and realize that they, they have a role to play. Um, so is that a perfect solution? No. I mean, I think part of the solution to fake news has to be that everyone needs to become a savvier consumer of news, right? You can't necessarily trust someone to flag for you what's, what's true and what's false. Um, so part of the responsibility has to be on individuals as well. Sure. I'm happy to address the, the question about surveillance and human rights and information gathering and sharing in an intelligence context and human rights. Uh, I think David touched upon what I think is one of the most pressing human rights concerns with respect to surveillance and then the nature of international sharing of information is the uh, lack of remedies for us as individual citizens to uh, hold government to account um, around the information they're taking from us. So we talk about this no notion of regulatory arbitrage. Without an international regulation of the right to privacy and the ability of intelligence agencies to access information, for me as an Australian citizen, uh, the United States government can take whatever they want from me without, without a warrant. 
Um, but if I'm in the UK or in my own country in Australia, they need a warrant to be able to access my information. But the nature of information sharing within the Five Eyes system means that basically the US government can spy on me and in fact the British government can spy on me whenever I'm outside of the country um, and share that information, which means they can basically get around whatever warrant protections there are around access to my information. Um, so we know that's happening and we know that's happening because of what Edward Snowden disclosed. Thanks to his disclosures, we know about our, the rights, uh, how our rights are being abused. The problem is that we don't really have an adequate system for uh, remedying those rights. I'm actually an applicant at the moment before the European Court of Human Rights um, for the failure of the UK government to provide an adequate remedy. So I allege that they've been spying on my correspondence, which is legally privileged. Um, they basically don't tell you whether or not that's happening or not. Um, so I think from that point of view, I think we have a lot to do both domestically in our own jurisdictions, but also internationally in thinking through how we better regulate and control the way that our information is accessed. Just very quickly on the uh, election uh, question. So cybersecurity is, uh, I, I share, I'm sure Kristen's concern is a really important um, concern. One thing that's really interesting, uh, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, at least until recently, had defined 15 critical infrastructure sectors in the United States, and the election system was not one of them, um, even though you, know, you could argue that you know, what, what critical infrastructure is more fundamental to American democracy than the election system. The other thing I'll, I'll emphasize, we all know it, but just it's helpful to be reminded that elections in the United States are, of course, administered locally. Um, and so what that means, uh, that's, that's good and bad. You know, I've heard people argue that it's good from a kind of security standpoint because it means there's a very distributed set of targets. But I think it's also, the, the flip side of that is it's that bad in the sense that, as you all know, the number of counties, for example, that you would have to uh, alter the tallies in to actually impact the overall result of the election is very, very small. And so my, then the question is, how good is the security in the weakest county in critical states in the United States, and, and the answer, uh, you know, if the answer is it's not that good, then that, that would be sobering. On the fake news thing, I'll just say that one thing I don't think, uh, one, I, I, I sometimes hear suggestions that the government, the state, should somehow get into the business of, you know, policing fake news, and, um, you know, you can imagine uh, how that could go off the tracks if there's some sort of a government entity that's deciding what you can and can't see because it's allegedly fake. So I think that would be a terrible idea. The other thing I'll mention is that to the extent that fake news is defamatory, that is, of course, already actionable. Not that that's a solution to the whole thing, but there is, you know, there is at least some uh, legal infrastructure there uh, to address it. Anyway, I'm sure. Great. We have a time for another round of questions, so we'll start over here. Before I ask, I want to ask if this is the content of the questions are being recorded or not. I'm joking. Um, I was very interested in uh, Mr. Villasenor's presentation about the compression of data. How actively are corporations investing in kind of compression of data? And then relate to Mr. Kay's uh, discussion about the Ethiopian case, how actively do they then also sell this information to other entities? Thank you. Azla? Great. Thank you so much for really excellent presentations. Uh, one thing I'm struck by in the presentations across the board here is that unlike many other areas of human rights challenges, the critical governments at least involved in some aspect of either undermining privacy protections or enhancing capacities for surveillance are themselves democratic countries, notably our own country at the moment, uh, but also as several of the presentations touched upon, other um, very strong democratic countries. And that raises the question, do we have greater leverage here to address the human rights challenges that are connected to this set of questions than we might in other instances. Uh, and to the extent that that's the case, are the levers primarily legal levers or are there other mechanisms we ought to think about? And this brings to mind, for example, especially after watching the video clip of Mike Pompeo, the, the film Citizen Four and other ways in which the message um, that some of the, these activities which are being deemed you know, national security threats or are being represented in a way that criminalizes them and suggests that they're engaging in things like material support can be resisted by altering or shifting the frame and that the locus there may be cultural. So I just wonder what thoughts any of the panelists might have about opportunities that are created when the locus of the human rights violations is at least in part in societies with some rights protections and that view themselves as democratic. Thanks. Tusa. 
Uh, thank you so much for this fascinating presentation. Um, I just had a question with respect to um, where, where the government should draw the line with respect to which information should be properly classified and which information should not be classified. And secondly, I had a question with respect to the role of the federal courts, if any, in potentially rebuff rebuffing this administra administration's attempt to um, violate uh, constitutional rights. Thank you. Thanks. Please. Hello. I, um, I have a, uh, a kind of a con conception of what I'm hearing here and what I've heard about um, these issues in the past that I think might be shared by I don't, some segment of the public. Um, it's this. We've got a, a, a huge, global, furious, ever more sophisticated, information collecting and surveillance system. It seems unstoppable, inevitable. And a raid against this kind of digital monster, which is infinite in size and complexity, are a few well-intentioned lawyers and others who seem, in com by comparison, quaintly, if lovably, analog. And I'm just wondering if, uh, if you can give us cause for optimism. Thank you. So I just, maybe I'll start by responding to the first question. I think it was about corporate, to what extent of corporations. I think th there's no you know, group of corporations that is rubbing their hands together gleefully trying to make storage cheaper for the express purpose of making it easier for authoritarian governments to surveil their citizens. Um, it's just the enormous growth. All the, it's frankly all of us who have demanded more powerful computers and laptops and you know, tablets and smartphones, which have driven this enormous investment in these technologies. Um, which are now so inexpensive that it becomes uh, possible to store essentially infinite amounts of information. And one fundamental change, which goes really even beyond the stuff that we're talking about here, although it's closely related to it, is that for most of human history, we were basically a select then store uh, society, where in the sense that you had to d affirmatively decide beforehand what to record and, and, and not to record. And that has inverted in the last decade or two. So we are now basically a store then select society, where everything gets stored by default fault and then later on at people's leisure, be it private corporations or the government, the information is there and therefore subject potentially to inspection um, by people in the future. And I think we are as a society still kind of coming to terms with that, uh, that transition and I don't think it is it is. It would be naive to suggest that that transition is in any sense reversible. I'm not saying it's naive to to hope for privacy. I think privacy remains incredibly important. But I think it would be a naive to assume that we are no longer going to be walking around with tracking devices in our pockets because that's not going to happen. We are always, for the rest of our lives, going to be walking around with tracking devices called mobile phones in our pockets. So we need to adapt to that world uh, uh, because that's the world that we are going to be living in. Um, Thank you for your question about sort of these ideas about cultural and political leverage around human rights issues. Um, I do think one of, the, one of the things we do a lot is to try to point out the hypocrisy of democratic governments like the UK, like the United States, in terms of the things that they complain about with respect to other states, um, other things that they're doing in their own countries. And, and I think that's, that's something important that we have to bear in mind and something that we say, because I do think that there is opportunity to push back further here in the United States where there is generally a respect for the rule of law and a great value placed on constitutional protections. Um, now I say that because I'm working on a case that is probably more political than it is legal and has been for a long time. Julian Assange is in the embassy in Ecuador having been granted asylum. We've won a UN decision, a UN working group decision saying that he's arbitrarily detained, he ought to be released and paid compensation by the UK and Sweden. Uh, and they're ignoring the decision. Yet if, the, if it were Pakistan or the Maldives or in fact Iran, um, when a publisher and a journalist is, is um, detained in that way, um, it's those countries that place pressure on countries who are breaching international law to comply. So I do think that we have a lot of work to be done here. I think that Citizen Four 
which I'm very proud to say that my foundation funded, and I'm a good friend of Laura Poitras, so I think she did a great job. That film had a greater impact on understanding the nature of Snowden's, uh, Snowden's revelations and the unconstitutional nature of what the United States was doing in terms of surveillance than any one legal case or any lecture or discussion like this has had. And it's important that the public understand the importance of these disclosures. Um, I will say I think that that's why the right to publish and national security journalism is so important because unless we know what the government is doing, we can't take any action. Um, and so cultural and political efforts to talk about this in a broader context are incredibly important. And in some cases, in Snowden's case and in the case of Julian Assange, can be far more important than anything we can do legally. David. So, God, there's so many great questions we could have. We could have another panel, maybe after this one. Um, but so I'll address maybe two sets of questions. I'll try to do it really quickly. So one is Austin's question on democratic accountability. I just want to back that up by emphasizing what she identified, which is a real trend of, um, of democratic countries adopting rules, particularly around surveillance, but other areas as well, that, um, that interfere with privacy, freedom of expression, um, public protest, and so forth. So in the US, I mean, realistically, there's been great debate since the Snowden revelations, but also limited legal response, um, not that much, and a continuation of public demonization of whistleblowers, uh, particularly in, in the intelligence space. So that's, that's deeply problematic, but then we also see over the last year, because this began during the Obama administration, um, things such as authorizing uh, CBP, um, Border Patrol, to seek uh, passwords from individuals and get access to devices. This is happening, this is in the United States, this is on our borders, and it's going to increasingly happen, I think, um, beyond the 100-mile constitution-free zone of our borders, uh, essentially. We see it in the UK with the adoption last year of the Investigatory Powers Act, uh, which really uh, gives government the ability and the authorization in certain cases to, uh, to undermine encryption and other digital security tools. We see in France the International Surveillance Act from two years ago. Um, so there's this increase, and those are just three countries among many. Um, Australia is another example where um, pressure on, on journalists, in particular covering uh, the immigration and migration crises around Australia, has been exceptionally difficult. So with all of that, like, what, are the, what are the options? I think there could be some hope, maybe to go to the last question, when you look at the amount of protests that came out into the street uh, after January 20th. And I think that we shouldn't downplay that we do have those kinds of tools and that the old tools of going to Congress, where you know, law doesn't get passed all that often anyway, um, that going back into the street for peaceful protests is probably going to be the future. I mean, I think the never, next several years, um, we should be leveraging those, those kinds of tools. But beyond that, we don't really have legal accountability tools in democratic societies right now when it comes to surveillance. And that's deeply problematic and is being modeled in all sorts of societies around the world and certainly makes countries that, are, that don't have democratic um, rule of law traditions feel that they can, they can do this you know, without, without harm to, you know, to surveil and, and conduct other forms of repression. Really quickly on classification. David, actually. <laughs> should I, I, should I stop there? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Whoever asked about classification, we can talk about Yeah, I'm also happy to answer that <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me just just weigh in briefly on on Asa's question. Um, you know, your, your question was, does this create greater leverage for democracies? And I think the answer is no. I think it actually creates less leverage, and here's why. It's not that the democracies are the only countries engaging in this behavior. It's just that those are the countries we know are engaging in this behavior. And so part of what happened with the Snowden revelations is that the revelation of, of what the United States was doing <laughs> gave non-democratic countries a tool to bludgeon the United States quite rightly in some circumstances, right? But it's not that other countries and authoritarian countries, as David's example from Ethiopia made clear, it's not that other countries aren't doing this. Most countries probably are in some circumstance. So the fact that we know what democratic countries are doing, I think has actually put them in a somewhat weaker position to exercise leverage. But also, I mean, I think part of what, what David's um, most recent comments make clear too is you have democratic countries passing laws through their democratic processes that authorize these types of surveillance. They may in many circumstances make us uncomfortable, but 
when we're talking about surveillance and the rule of law, it's a very difficult situation because we think that those are the processes that produce the rule of law. But part of the problem is we don't like the law that they're producing. So I think this, to get to your cultural point, this does get to a really fundamental debate about where should these lines be drawn and how can people who are concerned about these issues the most effectively affect what governments, how governments are drawing a line through, the, through democratic and other processes. Thank you. Um, before I ask you to thank our speakers, just an announcement that um, coffee is available outside and our next panel will start promptly at 11.30. So with that, I would like to uh, join me in thanking our speakers.